Um, thank you for all for coming. I know that the roads were relatively clear and you probably all had, um, hopefully you were all safe and in your homes last night and didn't do any unnecessary driving, but I'm so thankful that the roads cleared and we're able to have this program today. Um, I want to thank you all for attending. Again, my name is Michelle Petrazulo and I'm the director of the Rampart Library District in Woodland Park. If you all don't know where Woodland Park is, it's up, um, up the mountain from Colorado Springs. We have a beautiful view of Pikes Peak and I encourage you all to come and visit anytime um, and say hello at the Woodland Park Library. Um, let's see. Um, so my presentation today, just so you know, because everyone was, wants to know how, exactly how long programs are, it's going to be about 40 minutes. Um, a lot of my program is going to, I'm going to be showing two short clips of videos and one um, longer clip of a video that's approximately 20 minutes. Um, let's see. My presentation today is Jewish American Soldier Experiences of World War II. Um, Mainly, I'm going to be focusing on the American experience, um, but I do encourage you to look further. I brought some handouts today um, for further reading because the Americans weren't the only ones involved. Um, there were a lot of um, Jewish people of Jewish descent in the Soviet Union and Great Britain who were also um, involved in World War II. And I encourage you to take my business card as well. If you have any other questions um, regarding this presentation, I'd be happy to answer them at any time. If you want to feel free to email me or call me. I want to start off today with this image and these words of which you are all most likely familiar with as they have become such an important part of the American experience. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuge of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, the tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. These words are from a sonnet called The New Colossus by Emma Lazarus, who was born in New York City on July 22, 1849, into a large Sephardic Jew Jewish family. They were written in 1883 to raise money for the construction of the Statue of Liberty. In 1903, they were cast onto a bronze plaque and mounted inside the pedestal's lower level. This sonnet helped to shape the popular idea of the Statue of Liberty as a welcoming mother and of America as a great nation of immigrants. Unfortunately, however, the ideals of the new Colossus were never truly materialized for all people, including those of the Jewish faith, like, faith, like Emma, and in the upcoming decades, particularly those that lived in Germany and other countries that experienced fascism and anti-Semitism who wanted to immigrate to America. Throughout the 1930s and into the 1940s, as Adolf Hitler rose to power in Germany, isolationist sentiment in America was strong. Many Americans viewed Hitler's conquest as Europe's problem, not ours. The results of the poll is illustrated here were published on the pages of Fortune magazine in July of 1938, a time when Nazism was on the rise and the Jewish people were attempting to flee Germany. Fewer than 5% of Americans sur surveyed believed that the United States should raise its immigration quotas or encourage political refugees fleeing fascist states in Europe, the vast majority of whom were Jewish, to voyage across, to, across the Atlantic. Two-thirds of the respondents agreed from the proposition that we should try to keep them out. Nazism was not only present in Europe pre-World pre -World War II, there was also an effort in the American states to infiltrate the minds of Americans with Nazi ideals. On February 20th, 1939, for example, American Nazis gathered for a rally at Madison Square Garden in New York City. The event was organized by the German American Bund, one of several groups in the United States supporting fascism and Hitler. Outside of, a, outside of Madison Square Garden, there were thousands of protesters. Inside, 20,000 enthusiastic American fascists, American flags and a giant banner of George Washington were sandwiched between huge swastikas. While there was a small protest to this event, it was it went on as scheduled. As soon as the United States entered into the war, these types of fascist groups were discredited and disbanded. As the world prepared, prepared for another war, most people who left Nazi Germany wanted to immigrate to the United States, but to do so, they needed a visa, the official authorization to enter America. 
The U.S., however, put a quota on the visas it would issue for the residents in each country. In 1939, the quota for Germany was 26,000, and there were only 300,000 German applicants. There were more than 300,000 German applicants. Already suffering the effects of the Great Depression, to get a visa, prospective immigrants had to prove to the American authorities that they would have enough money to live on once they got there. Since the Nazis made it almost impossible to take money out of Germany, most refugees arrived in this country penniless. This meant that the visa applicants needed one or more American sponsors who would agree to support them if necessary and prove that they had the means to do so. The search for sponsors who would sign an affidavit of support was a major burden for refugees from the Nazis. Families had to make difficult choices, and it was common for only one child from a family, usually the oldest male, to immigrate to the United States. One young man who was able to immigrate to America was Kurt Klein. Born in Waldorf, Germany, Kurt left for the United States in 1937 at age 17 and settled in Buffalo, New York. His parents were unable to leave Germany before the outbreak of World War II. Kurt's parents were eventually deported to Auschwitz in German-occupied Poland in 1942. He eventually joined the United States Army and was trained in military intelligence. In Europe, he interrogated German prisoners of war. In May of 1945, he took part in the surrender of a village in Czechoslovakia and returned the next day to assist over 100 Jewish women who had been abandoned there during the death march. I'm now going to show you a short clip on Kurt um, talking about his immigration to America. It was becoming more and more evident that um, that uh, Jews uh, should leave if uh, anybody at all would have them, and not very many countries would have them. Uh, it, it wasn't quite that easy, but especially young people. Uh, uh, it was suggested for young people to, to leave because uh, there was obviously no future for them in, in Germany. And so uh, we too uh, came to that conclusion that I uh, and since we had some relatives uh, in the States, uh, th that seemed to be the, the natural place to go. Um, the, uh, I was fortunate, and now in retrospect, I know that that uh, must have saved my life. Um, my sister, who was older than I, uh, was then in nurses' training uh, in Germany. But uh, she also decided, of course, that it was time to leave, and uh, someone vouched for her on this end, and, and so she came here a year ahead of me. And uh, had she not been here, I, I would not have gotten out, because she was able to go after people and, uh, and, and, and ask them for, for the necessary papers that uh, one needed in those days, an affidavit of support. And uh, so she, she did that for me, and so that by 1937, uh, I was uh, able to, to leave uh, also and come to Buffalo. Um, at that time, my sister lived, and, uh, uh, so, and so did uh, various other relatives, among them an uncle and an aunt and their daughter, in whose house I, I then stayed uh, the first few years. Uh, when I came to Buffalo. 
he had to get the affidavit of support. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about that um, as we go along. Sorry, I'm having a little bit of a difficulty getting back to the right slide, but I'm almost there. Okay. Kurt was one of thousands of men who, against all odds, immigrated into, into the United States and became American soldiers despite pre-war isolationist sentiments. These soldiers would ultimately contribute significantly to winning the war. In order to fully understand what these soldiers experience, it's best to hear it from their own words. I'm now going to show you a 22-minute clip of a film called Jewish American Soldiers Stories from World War II. The full version of the film can be found on the website of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, and it is listed on the handout that I've provided. In 1933, we were thrown out of schools. We could no longer go to schools. I was thrown out of the ski club. I was thrown out of the track club. And friends of mine, we were together running. All of a sudden, ignored me completely. They went out of their way to avoid me, which of course was very difficult for me after spending years running with them, that they all of a sudden pretended they didn't know me anymore. My name is Howard Adler, also known as Hans Adler. I was born in Darmstadt, Germany on July 11, 1917. My parents came from Orthodox background and we maintained an orthodox home so our grandparents, my grandparents, would be able to come and visit and have a meal with us. I was hoping to go to the university after my high school education and eventually I was hoping to take over the business of my parents. However, Hitler spoiled all that. Hitler came to power in January of 1933. Before that, they had street battles between communists and Nazis, and it was quite a difficult period. And slowly but surely, he started his anti-Semitic programs, which he had outlined in his book, Mein Kampf. I came to America, and I came on the U.S. Washington. It took about 10 days at the time to travel from Hamburg to New York. When I arrived in 1936, my English was very poor, and I took a job where my vocabulary was not very important. I got a job as a sweeper in a shirt factory and it was very important for me to learn the English language. We listened to the radio whenever possible to get our ears accustomed to the sound. I remember buying the New York Times every morning. It was easier for us to read rather than to understand. When my parents arrived, the family got reunited. That was in early 1940. I had to register for the draft, and in 1941, January, they had the first draft call, and this is the only lottery I ever won. I was living in New York at the time of the draft, and most of the draftees going to Fort Dix came from the New York City area, and there were a lot of Jewish GIs with me. And when we moved to Bermuda, I must have said probably we had more than a million in our company of Jewish youngsters from New York. It was quite difficult for me to leave my home again and that I realized that I only had a few months with my parents to get reunited after having been separated for four or five years. I stayed in Bermuda till about April 1943, and then a 
directive came from Washington. They were looking for German-speaking GIs. And my company commander submitted my name to Washington. And after a little while, I was transferred to Camp Ritchie, Maryland, to become a intelligent member of the armed forces. Things got progressively worse in Germany. Stuff was taken away from them. Their life was made miserable. They started concentration camps. I was in one, and the name of it was Buchenwald. And that was a horrible experience by itself. I'm Henry Hirschman, and I served in the United States Army. I lived in a, a town nearby that was a railroad junction, and that chased us through the railroad underpasses. We got pushed into a railroad train, and that ended up in Buchenwald. I had a, a pending visa that finally came through. I didn't know that until recently. My parents really had to pay a ransom to get me out of the camp. So I got out of the camp in April, and I think I left in early May, get a ship to United States. It was 1939. My parents, my grandparents, my brothers, a lot of cousins, and a lot of my good people. And I always say, unfortunately, this is something that probably is going to go with me to my grave. I lost all those people, and I was the only one who got out. And I often thought, why didn't whoever did the taking take me too? If you uh, got prisoners, you took them into a, into a room and uh, you told them you were going to kill them if they don't tell you this or that. We were not specifically trained for that kind of work. You know, they just grabbed us because we could communicate. We would talk to them in German, you know, so they some of them would feel uh, while they had been killing Americans, they would feel better with, you know, people, with Americans that spoke German. So it was a wild time. I'm Werner Field and I'm 91 years old. I was born in Berlin in 1925. We were members of the Reform Synagogue. The principal of my high school knew my uncle, so I was a little bit protected, and I went to a regular German school, gymnasium. Essentially, everybody was trying uh, to get out, to uh, escape, and the HIAS found these people that my mother had known back in 1900 or so in Mercer, Pennsylvania, and they vouched for us. There would suddenly be a line and you'd get a phone call. They're lining up at the American Embassy. So you would walk to the American Embassy and line up for whatever it was. That was not constant, unfortunately, but possible way out. And indeed that helped us. We ended up in New York City and I went to high school and I had everything but the language essentially was in my hands. I somehow felt that I needed to help the country, my saviors, much to the chagrin of my mother. And at that time, they allowed engineering students to continue their engineering education. Uh, but I insisted on actually serving uh, in the army and within a very short time, I was shipped out to California 
by train and I was in a at UCLA studying German culture. Boot camp was in Camp Roberts in California. We were in France, Luxembourg and Germany. Counterintelligence, the 89th Division, 353rd Regiment. As a matter of fact, for some Jewish holidays, we got time off to go to another camp where they had services. Why did the, the COs, the commanding officers, you know, insist that the, the Jews go? I think that it reflected on the part of the commanding officer a sense that it was part of his duty to make sure that his men had the kind of emotional and spiritual support that religion could give. So it was assumed that religion helped to strengthen the fighting spirit of men. And uh, if there was a Seder or if it was like Rosh Hashanah, then yeah, you, you were going to go because the commanding officer probably had orders to let people go, but he interpreted them as saying, uh, you must go I instead. So I think that there was a feeling that religion was uh, something that, that helped morale. I don't know how it happened. I just think it just seems like we had the same uh, thoughts and the same uh, ways that we acted when things happened, and I guess the little words that you would say to each other, like, you know, that guy's a schmuck, and that guy's this, and that guy's that, so we seem to be able to communicate that way. Robert A. Fink, age 89, born November 23rd, 1926. Well, I was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. After a few years, moved to Bridgeton, New Jersey. Went to school in Bridgeton High School and graduated in 1944. It was a small city. I really had a group of friends that I enjoyed being with. There were about uh, four good friends myself. And I remember the girls, they had about five Jewish girls in Bridgeton. We dated and all had good times together. I was raised in a Jewish family. Um, I was not bar mitzvah family. Uh, we didn't have the money to go through that. However, I went to a Hebrew school and uh, I was a member of the Jewish Boy Scout troop that we had in Bridgeton. I enlisted as a pilot, navigator, or bombardier, and was sent to Fort Dix, and that's where my parents dropped me off. I remember that day, might have been really tough. I could see tears in my mother's eyes, and it was, it was not a very good time. We got on this train, and we were supposed to go to Amarillo, Texas, but we went by way of San Bernardino, California. I don't know how that happened. But we got at Amarillo and started basic training there. I bought a, a, a new Chevrolet Club Coupe. In those days, you either bought an automobile or got married. And I opted to get by an automobile all the time. My name is Leonard Schlesinger and I served for six years. I was born in Bishopville, South Carolina, a big metropolitan city of 3,000 people. We had in Bishopville at that time 30 Jewish families, which was unusual. And we had a rabbi for two years. And then uh, we did without one. We would close up the stores in town and we would have uh, a minion in a uh, department store, more or less. And then from Bishopville, I went to North Carolina State and I graduated in uh, 1940. And when I graduated in 1940, 
I got my commission as a second lieutenant. But when I graduated uh, North Carolina State, I needed money to pay for my automobile. I went to work for North American Rayon for a tremendous salary of $18 a week. So I had a wonderful boss, and I said to him, are there any Jews here? He says, of course we've got Jews. I said, I don't see them uh, in, in the roster. I said, where are the Jews? He says, you. So thank goodness, while I was there, I guess I was there for about a month when I got my orders to report to Fort McClellan, Alabama. We had uh, a visitor, a full colonel from Columbia, South Carolina, who came to talk to us. And this was in 1940. All of this happened in 1940. So he spoke to us and he says, gentlemen, we're going to war. Many of the stereotypes about Jews as being unwilling to fight or as being in the quartermaster's corps, that is to say, you know, supplying the troops, which is a, a behind the lines position, uh, came out of World War I. Um, they're older uh, stereotypes, and they were false then as well, um, but they were part of anti-immigrant sentiment that had f flourished in World War I. My roommate was a man from uh, Long Island who persisted in calling me, hey, Jew boy. Never called me Abe, never called me Abraham, never called me Cadet, A A Cadet Bober, uh, none of the names that you would normally call somebody, and he persisted in calling me Hey Jew Boy. I went to the CO of the base and complained to him, and they both told me we will talk to him. And it still did no good. And one day, he just irked me so, so badly. Our conditioning was similar to the conditioning that a professional boxer does. And this PT officer said, the way to get even with him, if you know how to use your hands in boxing, come down and I'll put you in the ring and you can go around with him. So I told him, I told this to my roommate and uh, he said, I'll gladly kick the you know what out of you, Jew boy. I said, well, that's fine, but let's go down and do it in the ring. Well, we go down to do it in the ring and we were supposed to box for two minutes and then get a two-minute rest back up again. Well, the very first thing I did when we got in the ring was when Captain Ginsburg brought us together at the, for the boxing match, he, uh, uh, said, now, come out, and I want a clean fight. And the minute that he said a clean fight, I stepped on his toes. And as a result, he dropped his hands. And that was all that I needed. I was in excellent physical condition, and I started peppering this guy with repeated punches to the head and to the body but mostly to the head. And before you know it, he is on the ropes and he's grabbing hold of the ropes to hold himself up and I won't let go. And finally, Ginsburg rang the bell. And a little beknownst to Frederick W. Benson III, little did he know that Ginsburg was a Jewish name. From that time on, I was known as Abe. I was in uh, Omaha, Nebraska, 
and we talk, and everybody was interested in the progress of the war. And I had just read an article, I had the New York Times mailed to me, and I read an article in the New York Times which quoted an American ambassador to Turkey, his name was Strauss, about the progress of the war. And I told him what he had to say. And one of the guys said in a southern drawl, ah, nothing but a Jew, who listens to him? Immediately, I jumped up. I said, come on, there's a gym here. I'm not going to do it in public. Let's get downstairs. They're going to knock the shit out of you. And uh, he said, like that, the couple of guys separated us. And I didn't talk to him after that. He avoided me. One of the reasons I remember it, I still burn about it to this day when I think about it. I do. Because if you notice, I clenched my fist sitting here. <laughs> Who wanted, uh, wanted to punch somebody out? They needed someone who was an expert in mine detection because tanks could very easily be dislodged, the tracks blown off if you go over a mine. Well, they look around the company, and out of 120 people, they pointed to me and said, All right, Goldberg, you be the mine detector expert. They gave me a one, one or two day training in German mines, and when I got overseas, we would get a call on the radio that there's a mine in the road and they needed mine detector Mo. Since my name was Goldberg, it became Mo. So mine detector Mo had to go to the head of the column and they would point to where they would see a German mine and I would have to probe it, dig it out, and, and pray that I wouldn't get blown up. You did not find too many Jewish boys that were becoming pilots while in the service. Jerry here was an exception to the rule that as to being a flight engineer who was really the right arm to the pilots on these big multi-engine aircraft. I flew a single-engine aircraft, the P-47, commonly known as the Thunderbolt. We were high altitude flying airplanes and were quite successful. And some of the efforts we performed of dive bombing and strafing. And I called a tower and I told him as to what is happening. And the first thing he says to me in his beautiful baritone voice, repeat after me. Yiskadal, the Yiskadash. <laughs> you've heard that story. Now you've heard it from a guy that it happened to. This is what he did. I told him to send a buggy out to pull me in and also to send me some clean underwear. <laughs> they were fighting a battle on three fronts, right? And uh, they really felt that they constantly had to prove themselves as fighters and as men worthy of respect by their fellow soldiers. So in the video that we are, are not able to watch right now, they, they mention a group called the Ritchie Boys. And that group, um, which I didn't know about until I started doing this project, and I read a book called um, Sons and Soldiers by Bruce, Bruce Henderson, who is an excellent author. Um, Camp Ritchie was a top secret training ground in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Maryland where soldiers were trained in military intelligence. The men trained here are now, now popularly known as the Ritchie Boys. Right now that camp is, is deserted and I think they're trying to make it into a historic um, site so that they can, um, they can make it into a functioning building again. So if you are, are interested in that, I would look that up as well. Um, but they were mostly Jewish American speaking refugees whose language and cultural knowledge about Germany made them perfect candidates for American military intelligence. Approximately 9,000 Jewish refugees were chosen to be part of the Ritchie Boys who took part in the D-Day operations and were once inside, and once inside German territory, they interrogated POWs, gaining as much information as they could in order to help the Allied forces. Nearly 2,000 were chosen to interrogate German POWs. Most heartbreakingly, they helped liberate the concentration camps the Nazis had built to exterminate their people. Most of those who had left family behind before the war would never see their loved ones again. 
After the German surrender in the spring of 1945, many of these men stayed in Europe to translate for occupation authorities and to interrogate war criminals. After the end of the war, some of them served as translators during the Nuremberg trials. Again, to learn more about the Ritchie boys, I highly recommend the book Sons and Soldiers by Bruce Henderson, which High Plains does have a copy or two of. During World War II, there were only three religious categories that could be put on American dog tags. P for Protestant, Protestant, C for Catholic, and H for Hebrew. This particular dog tag belonged to Private First Class Jerome Steigman of the U.S. Marine Corps. The Star of David, with the Hebrew word Zion on the back of his tag, was custom made by him and identified him as a Zionist and made a personal statement about his belief in the need for Jewish, a Jewish homeland. Wearing a dog tag that identified one as Jewish was obviously very risky on the European front and soldiers were at high risk for immediate death if captured by Germans. Many were instructed to discard their dog tags if at high risk of being captured, even though doing so would risk lack of identification if they were killed. According to Israel's Holocaust Museum Yad Vashem, about 1.5 million Jews fought in Allied armies, including 500,000 in the Red Army, 550,000 in the American Army, 100,000 in the Polish Army, and 30,000 in the British Army. 22 Jews attained senior rank in the American Armed Forces, 18 generals, 6 major generals, 12 brigadier generals, 1 vice admiral, admiral 2 rear generals, and, and 1 commodore. The total number of Jewish war casualties was 38,338. 11,000 were killed, 7,000 of which occurred in combat. Approximately 26,000 Jewish men and women were in uniform received, received citations for valor and merit. The number of awards totaled 49,315. Three Jewish American soldiers in World War II were awarded the military's highest distinction, the Congressional Medal of Honor. Benjamin Lewis Solomon of the 105th Infantry, United States Army, born September 1st, 1914, died July 7th of 1944. Isidore Siegfried Jachmann, Company B, 513th Parachute Infantry Regiment, and Raymond Zussman of the 756th Tank Battalion. And now for my final story, and I'm hoping to show a little bit of that video, but you all have a, a copy of the link if, um, if it doesn't work. Um, Gerda Wiseman was a Jewish Holocaust survivor, has written several books about her experiences. After Nazi Germany took over her homeland of Poland, she was separated from both her parents. They stayed and were sent to Auschwitz, and she, she to a series of labor concentration camps. In 1943, Forty-five, she was sent on a forced 350-mile death march to avoid the advance of Allied soldiers. She weighed 68 pounds, her hair had turned white, and she had not had a bath in three years. She was one of the minority who survived the forced journey. In 1945, Gerda was liberated by forces of the United States Army in Valeri, Czechoslovakia. While you watch this video that I'm going to show you, you will also hear Kurt Klein, who, in the beginning of my presentation, was in a video that discussed immigrating into the United States to escape the Germans prior to World War II and becoming a U.S. soldier. My very clear um, view of, of freedom and liberation came that morning when I stood in this doorway of that abandoned factory and I saw a car coming down the hill. And the reality of that came when I saw the white star on its hood and not the swastika. And there were two men in that car. One jumped out. I saw some skeletal figures uh, uh, trying to, to get some water from a hand pump, but over on the other side, uh, uh, leaning uh, next to the end, against the wall, next to the entrance of the building, I saw a girl standing, and and I decided to go walk up to her. I remember that aura of of that awe of of, of the disbelief in daylight, to really see someone who fought 
for our freedom, for my ideals. And uh, he looked like, like God to me. And I asked her in German and in English whether she spoke either language, and she answered me in, in German. And I, uh, I knew what I had to say. And I said to him, we are Jewish, you know, for a very long time. At least to me it seemed very long. But he didn't answer me. And then his own voice betrayed his emotion. He was wearing dark glasses. I couldn't see his eyes. He said, so am I. I asked uh, about her companions. He said, may I see the other ladies? A form of address we hadn't heard for six years. I told him most of the girls were inside, they were too ill to walk. And he said to me, won't you come with me? I didn't know what he meant. So he, he held the door open for me and let me precede him. And that was the moment of restoration of, of humanity, of humaneness, of dignity, of freedom. We went inside the factory. Uh, it was an indescribable scene. Uh, there were women scattered over the floor on scraps of straw, uh, some, some of them quite obviously uh, with a mark of death on their faces. I took him to see my friends. The girl who was my guide uh, made sort of a sweeping gesture over this scene of devastation and said the following words. Noble be man, merciful and good. And I could hardly believe that she was able to summon a poem by the German poet Goethe, which was called, is called, The Divine, uh, at such a moment. And there was nothing that she could have said that would have underscored the grim irony of the situation better than, than what she did. And this first young American of Liberation Day is now my husband. He opened not only the door for me, but the door to my life and my future. Gerda and Kurt's first encounter outside a booby-trapped warehouse in Europe on May 7, 1945 blossomed into a 57-year love affair with a tireless mission to battle intolerance and hunger and to turn heartache into hope for generations ranging from Holocaust victims to Columbine High School survivors. They are both tireless advocates of Holocaust education, human rights, and tolerance. Together they founded the Gerda and Kurt Klein Foundation, which promotes an education, works to lessen prejudice and discrimination, and empowers students across the United States through education and community service. Mr. Klein passed away in 2002. Gerda is still alive and working for her foundation. Um, in addition to bringing his future wife to safety, Lieutenant Klein also helped arrange safe passage into American hands for a group of suspected German prisoners who, turn, who turned out to be concentration camp escapees. Only after 1987, when one of the prisoners wrote to him, did Mr. Klein learn that, um, learn that among the group he saved was a person who became famous decades later for his own her heroics. His name was Oskar Schindler. In 2010, Gerda Weissman Klein received the Presidential Medal of Freedom by President Barack Obama, the highest award that can be given to a civilian for her lifelong commitment to educating the, pu the public about Holocaust and racial tolerance. In 2008, Klein co-founded Citizenship Counts, a national nonprofit organization whose mission is to educate students on the rights of, and responsibilities of citizenship, inspire their pride in America, and educate them to participate in community service. While so many stories of the war and the Holocaust are tragic, I hope that you've found this last story inspiring. While many Jewish soldiers who went back to Germany to fight the Nazis found a devastation and in so many cases lost entire families to the atrocity of the Holocaust, there's also a flicker of light of hope in the darkest of hours. 
For decades, Kurt and Gerda helped to build back up what was torn down. They played a large part in educating future generations on not only the atrocities of war and the Holocaust, but also on the wor in the words of Goethe, on hope, restoration, freedom, tolerance, humanity, humanness, and dignity. This was not the only individual work of this couple. Without the con contributions of 550,000 Jewish American soldiers who as young men fled Nazism because of hate and intolerance, we would not live, we would live in quite a different world today. I would like to take one last brief moment to tell you about the personal project of mine called Letters Home, a history of war through letters. Um, in 2017, I started collecting personal letters, photographs, scrapbooks, and other memorabilia of soldiers from, Mex from the Mexican-American War to Desert Storm. Um, from these items, I created 27 panels to tell the in individual stories of soldiers. Um, these items have been digitized and will eventually be available um, throughout the world in the Digital Public Library of America. Um, the panel displayed here is one of Raymond Greger of the 45th Infantry Division. Um, during World War II, the 45th Infantry Division had the longest um, days in active battle during World War II, and they were also the um, first ones to um, liberate the concentration camp of Dachau. And Raymond lived in Woodland Park, um, which is where my library is, so that his story is especially um, special to me. Um, but I'm currently working on my next set of panels and looking for new letters and stories to share. Um, so if you know of a loved one or you yourself are a veteran who would like to be involved in this project, please pick up um, some of my information or my card and I hope um, to hear from you. And um, I hope you all enjoyed the presentation. I can try to play that one video again. I apologize for the technical dif difficulties. Um, but. I hope that you all enjoyed today's presentation and that you take the handout it's, that has the link to that and to other um, videos and books related to the Jewish American experience um, during World War II. And I want to thank you all for coming out today. Um, I really appreciate it. And I also want to encourage you to um, go to the other events that are um, happening, and especially if you have the opportunity to hear from a survivor. It is a once in a lifetime experience, and as we know, those survivors are um, getting older and um, the opportunity is less and less each year to hear from a survivor. So I really encourage you all to do it because it's something that um, I think all should, he all should hear and it is a life um, changing experience to do so. So thank you very much for your time. And for those who want to stay, I'm going to try to play the video. <laughs> Questions about oh, research or I could, yes. Well, I Thank was you. wondering when Kurt Klein talked about his sister helped him get out, mm -hmm. how did she get out? Did you find out? I mean, no, that's a good question. I didn't look into that at all, so I need to look into that myself. I know that they have, she has a, a lot of books, and there are, I think I listed a few of her books, and she, she created a documentary, or they, they wrote a documentary on her that was on HBO, and I think it, I think it won an Academy Award for Best Documentary. For the year it was made, um, it's on the on the handout. Sorry, oh, okay. can I take I this one more time? Oh, it's Kurt, it's, it's Kurt Kurt Klein's. Um, and I'm sorry, no, that was Kurt Klein's wife. But they might they might mention it in the in the video. Um, let's see. It's called um, in her own. No, wait, that's not it. One Survivor Remembers, I think, is, is the name of her video. And that, I think, is available through High Plains. I had another question, too. I guess, in some ways, I feel it's not fair that that, that, that um, screenshot where the American people in 1937, or also it was 1939, overwhelmingly voted not to take refugees Jewish refugee children, because my understanding from talking to my mother-in-law, talking to my dad, who was in World War II, American people didn't know what was going on over there. Mm -hmm. So when I saw that data, I thought, that's not really fair. I mean, mm -hmm. I think if you show that to young people, it needs to be prefaced mm -hmm. that 
People well, yeah, we didn't know. know. Nobody knew. No. So if they were overwhelmingly saying, no, we don't want these Jewish children, we did not know what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. I just think that's an unfair slide. I, I get it. Mm -hmm. or I, at the time, I think it was the reality because we didn't know. And the, 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 the point I was trying to make with it is, and maybe I could have put that in the slide, is we didn't know as a nation what was going on there. And the results of that were that that was the result of the poll. And as a result of that, we didn't take the people that we should have taken um, at that time because we didn't know the devastation that was going to happen. And, and exactly what was going on in Germany at the time until afterwards. Do you know were there more polls? Did the American people really get to say anything? I, I guess I always assume the government makes all the decisions. I, I'm pretty sure when I did my research it was mostly the government and it, it did have to do a lot with the economic state at that time because of the depression and people were worried that if people were immigrating into the country that it would take jobs and it would cost more money and at the time they were still healing from the, the depression and that it was that was just the idea that they had but obviously I think if we can go back in time it would be a totally different situation and we would have welcomed people with open arms and did a lot more and I'm, I'm in my opinion we probably we would have joined the war effort a lot earlier as well so we didn't join until later on Yeah, I think if I, if I was able to show the video I was going to show, a lot of those soldiers talk about the discrimination that they encountered um, during training and with it, some of the names they were called. And um, I mean, there were inspirational stories as well, but they do talk a lot about the struggles that they had um, in America. And it, it is a, something that we have to face as a nation is that we, we, we did encounter discrimination. We, we were discriminatory towards um, different populations, including people of Jewish faith. Um, it was just something that, that happened at that time. Um, so I, I went to uh, the presentation by John Michael about the introduction of the Holocaust and the Holocaust coming into full effect. And she did talk about that these things were being modeled or happening, and even American newspapers were just choosing not to report on them. So American newspapers would have chosen these funny stories, but they, they figured there wasn't enough interest in what's happening in Europe, what's happening in Europe. So. Not new information. <laughs> that the newspapers <laughs> scream. Okay, Mark. The same year as military could have dropped bombs on all the railroads. We could have done that. I'm going to bring you the microphone. I'm sorry. Anyhow. Is this close enough? I think people need to realize that the, the Depression of 1929 did not end until we started into the war in 1941. I, I came up with a farm in Nebraska. Uh, we had very little to eat. Uh, it, it was a very, very, very poor time. So we had trouble taking care of our, putting food on our own tables. Uh, and and you, you wore hand-me-downs and you walked everywhere because you couldn't afford gas to fill otherwise. Yeah. It, it was a severe depression. And I think that I covered it a little bit with the affidavit of support. They were, people were not able to, even though there was an opportunity to come over, they had to go through the paperwork of proving that somebody else would be able to financially support that person so that it wouldn't be a burden um, to America. You know, we had to have um, guarantees, so to speak, that um, that wouldn't affect our economy and they'd be able to contribute and it wouldn't, so, and that's why most families were not able to, as they mentioned, as Kurt Klein mentioned, weren't able to send every child. They had to make the difficult decision and sometimes they were only able to send one person and it was usually the oldest male in the family. So that was a very difficult decision on their part as well. So um, 
one more way that they were able to, through blue tape and paperwork, limit the amount of people that were coming over. So, yes, sir. Yes. Was it one of the campaign slogans of the president in office? He kept America out of war. I think and also, was. don't forget the America First movement, which was one of the leaders of the America First movement, was uh, probably the all-time rock star hero of the country, Charles Lindbergh. Mm -hmm. And so, we, we, who wants war? We didn't want to get involved. We thought it was a European problem. So I can, I can sympathize with people, you know, when we, with all that happening, it's a little easier to see why they didn't, but it's a, a tragedy that they didn't, because mm -hmm. the human loss of World War II, of the concentration camps. We may have lost the person who could have, who could have cured cancer. We may have lost, it's unspeakable, it's unknowable. And it's just a, a tragedy that just rips the, the heart out of any, any humane person, even to today. It's just, it just uh, stories like, uh, I had the privilege of uh, listening, on, listening on recorded version of uh, Everything But My Life by, by Gerda. And it just, it chills you to the bone to see what, what she had to go through, what little they had to eat. And, and she just somehow must have had enough determination inside her because she had friends that, that seemed to be as, as good a shape as she was in. And they basically gave up and died. When, when, you're, when it's a, it seems like a hopeless situation for so long, you give up and die, but she determined that somehow that she was going to try and survive, and her story is just, just remarkable. It really is. It's so interesting, some of the issues that are contemporary now, too, because talking about how um, we need to go take care of everybody. I mean, obviously, we should have done more if we would have known more, but again, the United States coming to the rescue and going in and saving, saving everybody. Anyway. Another thing I wanted to say is this continued. Uh, my son-in-law's mother had four children. She was widowed, and she couldn't come into the United States in the 50s. So it, it wasn't just limiting um, <coughs> Jewish children or Jewish people. The United States has had many times where they said, no, you cannot come in. We're either you're not the right profiling or whatever. So sometimes I think people, I never knew that. Mm -hmm. I didn't get that in the history books, that mm -hmm. the United States, through the course of history, they have restricted access for certain people. Mm -hmm. And she had to go to Canada. She wanted to come to the United States, but she was widowed with four children, the U.S. wouldn't take her. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. one, of, one of the things I think about when I come here every year at, to the Holocaust Remembrance is one of the things that we talk about with the Holocaust is never forget, never again. And these things are still happening in the world. There are still Holocausts happening in the world. And you know, it's, it's a shame that it's happening. A lot of times um, we see it on the news. Sometimes we don't see it on the news. But I guess think, I think the message I want to leave from that is just to be always aware and do, we, we can't change everything ourselves, but we can each do something um, to either make other people aware of what is happening in the world, to donate money to whatever organization we think is going to affect in a positive way these people, to share that type of information with others because it is happening again. It, it happens every day. And a lot of people aren't aware. If you go to the um, United Nations website and look at and see the lists of people who are who are being totally eliminated, it's shocking. In your research, when you were talking about the dog tags, wasn't it stupid that they had each? Um, did you see any justification why the government felt they had the label? I mean, that was putting those soldiers at risk. With that more if they were captured. That's ridiculous. There's, there was one story I kept out of the presentation because I thought it was going to be too long. I wish I had put it in since we weren't able to show the video, and I can't remember the lieutenant's name, but it was a story about a lieutenant and his, um, his group who were captured by Germans and put into a POW camp, 
and the German soldiers had instructed them, we need to have the, the Jewish soldiers, they need to step aside. And the soldiers said, we're all Jewish. We're, not, we're all Jewish. You know, they would not tell or, or step aside to identify the Jewish soldiers because they knew what was going to happen if they did. And um, I don't think he, he, he passed away, and I wish I could remember his name. Um, for those of you who want to um, connect with me, I'll email it. But um, he still has not received, even posthumously, the, Med the Medal of Honor. And I think that's, that lieutenant, I believe he was a lieutenant, um, deserves that because he saved lives that day. And that whole unit, just to, to say we are all one, to me, was very powerful and inspirational. What? Why did they put that on a dog tag? I was in the military, and I was used to joke about his dog tag because it had their blood type on it, and then underneath that it had their religion. And so his said, a positive Christian. So, <laughs> he always thought it was funny. Um, but, but that's the reason why they did that. They, they had to have a religion on there so that they could treat your body accordingly. Because according to different religious customs, you would be treated so, it. So, there was no malicious intent. I don't think it was just that was what it was. Mm -hmm. Was probably the yeah. Really, I mean, when you looked at the big picture, for them to have changed their policy for what they were doing in this situation, you would, you know, we know they, how they government works. That's, that's why. I yeah. Didn't that. Interesting. It could have been done in a cold way. Right. I think also we didn't know the certain the extent to what the Nazis were doing to the German German people. I know that when I. I know for myself, my grandfather helped um, liberate Buchenwald, which was a subcamp of, um, I mean, I'm sorry, Langenstein, which is a subcamp of Buchenwald. But when I did a presentation here a few years ago, you know, a lot of the testimonies from these soldiers were they didn't really know why they were over there. They're just following orders. They were drafted into the military and sent overseas and. You know, they were too busy trying to just survive. They weren't reading the news as to what was going on, or, or most of that intelligence was coming to America and coming to the president. But when they came across, when they came upon the concentration camps, you know, they were first of all devastated to see what was going on and horrified. But they all realized at that point that's why they were there. That's why they were fighting. Um, so I think a lot of times they they just didn't know what was what was happening or didn't think. Um, in, in terms of if I'm identified and I have this H on my dog tag, what's going to happen to me? Of course, when they got there, they probably had a little bit of, more of an idea, but um, until they went into the concentration camps, they really didn't know um, that, so. Any other questions or comments? I really appreciate you all, um, especially at the end, I'm, I'm so glad that you asked if I was taking questions because to me, that's the most valuable part of the presentation is learning um, what other people's people have to think or experiences in in this. So, but I thank you all for coming, and I appreciate you all being here. And again, if you have an opportunity to go to to any of the other programs going on this week, I highly encourage it. And thank you so much. <laughs>